A very good afternoon from India. I, Dr. Bharti Yadav from National Law University, Delhi, welcome you all to the skill course. This course will be of five days and we will be having session every day. Once again, I welcome you to the course and I hand over uh, the introduction to my colleague, Professor Margaret, to introduce herself and uh, give a little bit about the course introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, as you can probably hear from my accent, um, I am not Indian. <laughs> I have the privilege to be visiting uh, Delhi and National Law University from um, New York State, a town called Buffalo. And I'm working with Dr. Yadav on teaching legal skills here at NLU Delhi. Um, I, I will be here for this semester. The objective of this course is for us to give you some experience, background, demonstration, and practice in some of the concrete skills that it takes to be an attorney, right? So maybe you are reading the law in your classroom, but you may not have the opportunity to practice, right? Um, and so we are trying to give you a small opportunity in practicing. So today's class is on uh, client interviews. The objective of the class is to uh, provide you some background, a demonstration, and an opportunity to practice um, an ethical and thorough client interview, right? So when I say client interview, what we mean is when a client is coming to you as the advocate or practicing attorney, we would say in the US attorney, um, uh, how do you interact with that client? How do you get that, that client to speak, to trust you, to tell you what you need to know so that you can be an effective advocate? Uh, as you hear from Professor Margaret, that what exactly is the uh, objective of today's uh, lecture and what is the agenda for the today's session? It is very much clear and evident from the course introduction that this course not only aims at giving you theoretical knowledge and understanding about interviewing skill, but it also to help you to learn the practical application of those skills, the knowledge and the theory, which we will be helping you through. That is why the agenda for today's class includes not only the theoretical understanding of uh, relevance of uh, interviewing skills, and the different stages uh, for interview and how we can do it and uh, what are the consequences and what are the uh, hardships one face and what could be the uh, defaults for not uh, learning and knowing the appropriate skill for interviewing. We will be demonstrating uh, a small video in which uh, we will ask you that, okay, you uh, got to learn the skill through our narration. Now, just observe the video which we are presenting before you and then see that, do you think that it is in compliance with the theoretical inputs which we have given? You need to critically analyze to check your understanding of the initial discussion of the class and our discussion and delivery for the course and the particular lecture will not end there. It will take you further to exercising some of the interviewing skills to assess your own understanding. So this course has complete three components. That is a theoretical understanding of each of the components, which you already know through the brochure of the course. Uh, then we will be demonstrating the theoretical understanding so that you could check your understanding. And then we will be uh, giving you some exercises because skill course can be better understood while learning and while doing and learning. To understand, so we will be sharing the PPT with you. Uh, do let us know if it is visible to you. Bharti, before you start, may I uh, take your floor for a few minutes? Sure. So I am a professor emeritus of law in Istanbul, and I am very thankful to Bart and Margaret 
to offer this course to all of us. I'm also involved in a project now in Turkey where the lawyers interview a woman who has been uh, subject to family violence. And in this respect, I have tried to find some sources in Turkish how to interview a client. But unfortunately, I didn't find any written material. But you provided us with some English co course materials, and I'm very glad to have that. And mm -hmm. I'm going to carefully listen to your courses about client interview. But maybe you can also go some into the details of family violence interviews if you uh, have any expertise on that one. So sure. thank you for allowing uh, to take part our Turkish students. It shall be a good opportunity for them to interact with your students as well. Maybe in the future, they may come together and shake hands with each other. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Genese, uh, for giving us uh, inputs uh, uh, to take care of the uh, needs and concerns and understanding of uh, the students uh, who have registered for the course. We'll definitely try to incorporate your suggestions in the delivery of this course. We certainly have certain practical illustrations where we will be trying to incorporate the suggestions given by you. So before we start uh, today's agenda, which you already know uh, that it talks about uh, the strategies for conducting interview, uh, demonstration of interview and the practical skill. But first of all, whenever we try to understand any concept or skill, the most important thing is to understand the relevance of that subject or a skill, because that motivates us to work hard, to push our limits, to excel in that skill. The big question which arises is, why do we need to learn the interview skill? What can be served better by learning this interview skill? So I'll be sharing a PPT with you so that uh, you get a visual uh, impact of understanding also, particularly for the students who have joined uh, from uh, other countries in this course. So I uh, just share my screen. Yeah, I hope our screen is visible to you. So to understand the relevance of today's topic of discussion that is interview skill, we need to first of all understand that what can happen or what could be the consequence of not following the interviewing skill or not getting, uh, not learning adequate skills to conduct an interview? An answer in one word is a big surprise. Mm -hmm. When a person, a attorney, appears before a court with full preparation, they are more confident. Whereas when an advocate, or an attorney appears before the court with limited understanding of the facts and he comes to know about those facts from the opponent advocate, then it gives him big surprise. It limits his analysis ability. It makes the position of his own client weak. So not conducting interview effectively has its own consequences, which diminishes the chances of winning for the client apart from any other reason which would contribute in the defeat of a case. So the relevance of interviewing skill is very much. And we need to understand this fact before we proceed ahead for understanding that how interview can be conducted effectively. When we say that the consequence of not conducting interview can be answered in one word, that is surprise. We get surprises, the attorney gets surprises. We, we need to think and we tend to think that what a surprise means. Surprise means not getting adequate information from the client and getting to know from the opponent party. Surprise means missing an opportunity of knowing the fact which could have strengthened the position of your client before the court of law. 
just because the reason you didn't realize the relevance, importance, and strength of effective interviewing skill, you missed out on all such information and you made the case yourself weak and that adversely affects your position in the profession of practicing law. Because when you present your case strongly, I'm using the word presenting the course, uh, case strongly and not just uh, emphasizing on whether you win a case or you lose a case. I'm emphasizing on the term, when you represent the case strongly, even if you lose the case, that adds to your reputation as a practicing advocate, that you did your work properly. You didn't leave any stone unturned. Later on, whatever may be the result of the case, but you carry with you a reputation of well-learned advocate in whose hand the interest of a client is better served. So um, let's talk about what are the, um, the ways or, or the, the reasons um, we wanna make sure we, uh, we do effective interviewing, right? So um, we wanna be effective, we want to be careful. Why? We don't want to miss any important facts. We don't want the client to be confused, right? Um, we want to facilitate a quick as possible resolution, right? So that may or may not be possible, but we want to facilitate the, the resolution. We want to have appropriate strategies. Um, we really want to have the, the, the client tell us the truth, right? So we'll talk about how sometimes the clients don't, they, 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 they may be coming to you on the worst possible day of their life if they're in trouble, right? Or if they're facing a, 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 a change or a problem, or if they're seeking maybe a separation from their spouse, um, the, the example that Dr. Yenesey mentioned, or protection from their spouse, they may be very frightened, right? So um, we have to keep that in mind, right? We, we will talk about how emotionally laden the conversations can be, emotionally filled, emotion filled, right? By, you know, a little bit later in the PowerPoint. Um, but we need to keep in mind that um, while respecting the client, we want to make sure we get as much of the picture, right, as possible. Um, and we want to get, we want to have the best resolution. So if I'm in a position where I ask my client questions, my client, for whatever reason, doesn't tell me the truth, what happens? I go and I take a position on behalf of the client based on what the client said, but maybe the other side has proof that my client is not telling me the truth. That's a bad, that's a bad position to be in better, right? Better to know the whole story, um, the bad and the good. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so as we uh, just get to hear that, what does effective interviewing means and how it can benefit, I'm sure that all of you must have understood the relevance importance and impact of effective interviewing skills. Now we'll move ahead to learning the stages of interviewing. And generally we think that interview starts when the client has entered your office and you are in conversation with him, means the in-person conversation. But in fact, it starts much before it. It starts on a day when for the first time client calls you for an appointment and he shares with you minimal information about the concern he is facing and regarding which he wish to discuss something with you. So you need to understand that even when a client is not in person with you, he is calling you telephonically or maybe through, uh, uh, through emails, your contact with your client, your negotiation with the client has started. And you need to learn a skill of interviewing even before the client actually steps into your office. So 
the thing which you need to learn is when the client calls you telephonically or approaches you through emails also you need to do certain things in your mind and understanding first of all listen to him peacefully you should take up the calls when you are not in hurry otherwise what happens you are missed out on certain important information and because of which you will not be doing your homework properly before you uh, you 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 give an appointment to the client for in person interview so make sure that when you listen to your advocate for the first time from distance which is not in person conversation your mind is not engaged in any other task you can focus on each and every word of what client wish to share with you because this is the time when you start building a rapport with your client when you give respect to your client even before you meet him it adds to the comfort zone it adds to the confidence of a client in an advocate otherwise a client which is already in so much of stress and trauma or trouble feels that the person is not understanding what the client is going through and he does not uh, does not uh, find it comfortable in developing a relationship of trust with his advocate so pay attention to the stage that for the first time when the client has called you give complete attention to what your client is saying and then on the basis of that limited information and before you give an appointment to the client for in person interview do your homework which includes which includes first of all check your eligibility you need to check whether the subject matter which the client just narrated to you or the subject matter to which the client's concern relates to falls in your expertise or not receiving or taking up a case in the area which is not your expertise or the area which you don't deal with can never put the client case on a stronger position before the court of law so before analyzing the 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 strength and weaknesses of a client case first of all you need to analyze your own strength and weaknesses you need to ensure check whether the subject matter of the client concern falls in your domain of expertise and practice you need to do your homework do some research to know what are the legal issues involved in it whether it's practically feasible third thing is try to build rapport with your conduct and the way you listen to the concern of your editor, of your clients telephonically or electronically so um we are going to talk to you about the stages of an interview right um dr yara talked to you about before the interview and um i'm going to talk to you right about the opening stage what happens when the interview is starting so it would be easy to think well that's we don't have to think about that right we don't have to prepare for that um the person just comes in and i'll have you know someone get them some coffee or water or tea sorry tea uh, <laughs> um but actually um if you think about the emotions of the client right that this is a very important matter for the client how you initially greet the client listen to the client um and 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 signal to the client that you have the time the energy and and the resources to to listen and hear is very important so in the opening stage right maybe the the beginning of the interview um you are going to have a private place for your interview uh if if that's possible um you are going to make sure the client is comfortable Sometimes lawyers choose instead of to sit behind a desk like the way I'm sitting behind a desk and have a client on the other side you can sit with your client at a table right you're trying to make yourself accessible to your client right you're trying to communicate with body language that you are ready to help 
okay? Um, you introduce yourself, right? And you can always make uh, what we would say in the US, a little small talk, right? Or icebreaker, right? Did you find parking or um, did you find the office? Was the elevator working? Something like that. Um, and, you and you introduce yourself, right? And maybe you say a little bit about the firm. Um, you want to make sure that you are really listen to what the client first says, right? So, um, so a lot of the things I'm talking about are about um, body language, right? Body language. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's an English expression, but you're signaling with how you sit and how you look, right? That you are respecting the client, right? And you have time to listen. Um, so in the beginning stage, you are making the client comfortable. This is also the stage where you may give an overview of how it will go. So just like we gave an overview, right, of what, how we will spend two hours with you today, um, you can give an overview to the client, right? The client maybe has never seen a lawyer before, right? So we're trying to put ourselves in the client's shoes. Um, so um, you wanna let the client know, um, I wanna hear from you, I will, um, we, we have an hour, maybe to give the, the client your time period. I wanna hear what's bothering you, um, why you're here. Um, and then I will tell you some of the ways in which we can proceed. It can be very simple. It can be very simple, but that gives the client a sense of comfort, right? You like to know what to expect, right? And so we want the client to know what to expect. Um, you, you're also, when you do open it up to the client, you're, you're waiting to see how does the client start. You're waiting to, you're, you're trying to watch the client's cues, what the client has to say. Um, and you want to encourage the client to talk, right? This is not the time to show off, right? To you know, show off your legal knowledge, how many legal words you know, what your grades were in law school, what a good firm it is, right? You don't need to do that. Um, most people don't necessarily, are not necessarily going to be comfortable in a legal office, although it depends on the matter, of course, it depends on the type of client, um, but they want to be listened to. They're coming because they want to be listened to. Uh, as we just heard that there are different stages for interview and uh, we just heard about the opening stage. The next stage which follows to the opening stage is the narrative stage. This is the stage which comes after opening stage and you have made your client comfortable through your body language, through your demeanor, conduct, surrounding of your office and you have kind of created a rapport with the a client with your opening uh, opening conversation, which was not in person. And this uh, you know, another stage before the narrative stage. And now when the client is in person in front of you and you are just all ready, all charged up, all geared up to get the main body of the information and knowledge which is needed to build upon a client's case. So this narrative stage is stage where you encourage your client to speak, to narrate his side of the story. So it requires you to ask open-ended questions so that you don't restrict, uh, you don't, uh, restrict the domain of information which is, which is uh, coming in from the client. So questions like, okay, what brings you today here to my office? gives a wide coverage of the information which can flow from the client. You need to ensure that you don't, you, you don't leave this narrative stage too fast because if you leave this narrative stage too fast and if you are in hurry, then you may end up losing some important aspect which can 
which can bring to your knowledge certain important facts and knowledge which can help you in furthering your research. So there are certain things which you need to ensure at this stage that is let the client speak freely as much as possible. Ask open-ended questions. Don't listen with the preconceived notions. Don't jump to confusion. Keep yourself neutral as much as possible. Don't leave the stage too early. And encourage the client to speak as much as possible. Because this is the stage from which you get subtopics for the next stage. So this is the stage where you just collect all the information which can come in. And your task is to facilitate Facilitate your client to feel comfortable and share the information and later on decide whether all the information shared by a client is relevant or not. If the, star, if the client starts speaking and if you think that he is stepping on to the subject matter, which as per your legal knowledge is not that relevant, but don't object and restrict and stop your client. Because then it may make feel client that you, you are scrutinizing him or uh, you are working with some preconceived notion or something. So just let the client speak and later on you do your work to segregate the relevant and not so relevant information which you received at this stage. Um, okay, so you've had the opening, right? Um, where you've established some rapport You've had the narrative stage where the client has given you their story, right? So all law is really based on a story, right? The story of what happened to that client. Um, and now there's the third stage, maybe the post-narrative stage. Um, and this is when you become a little more involved, right? So um, you're going to ask them some probing questions. Maybe you ask the, the, the client, well, what does the opposition say? What is um, what are some you know things that the, the opposing party could say? You're going to ask the client, what would you like? Sometimes clients want an apology. Sometimes clients don't want litigation. Sometimes clients don't want to spend a lot of money, right? Um, sometimes they want to maybe be assertive, but make sure they continue the relationship with. The person they're having trouble with. So you need to know that. As a lawyer, we might think, let's go to court. The client might not want to go to court or need to go to court. So you have to ask um, probing questions, right? Questions about what are the arguments on the other side, or maybe if you see any inconsistencies, why did XYZ happen? You have to uh, figure out what the client wants. Um, you have to figure out, well, how does the client want to accomplish this, this goal? Although you are the lawyer, you can listen to the client. Maybe the client does not want to be in a court case for years in, in, in the US. It could be years and years, right? Um, maybe that's not what the client wants. Um, so th those are some things you need to find out. Um, then, um, and this maybe I could touch on um, Dr. Yenesey's question about interviewing a domestic violence um, victim, which is a very, a very good question and it's very complex, right? Um, but one of the things when you're interviewing someone who is undergoing trauma or in trauma is um, providing resources and discussing legal and non-legal approaches, right? So um, there may be things that there may be non-legal approaches that the um, client can, that will make the client happy, right? That, that may be working the problem out, maybe going to um, a mediator. It may be seeking, um, you know, advice, um, you know, from an accountant. There may be non-legal approaches, right? Or non-legal resources that the client needs. Um, so those are the kinds of things you're, you're, you're basically, giving the client a little bit of legal education, not a lot, and you don't need to use big vocabulary words, right? Because you want to be clear, but you're, you're, you're starting to show, right? A little bit what it's like to be in a legal proceeding. There's an adversary. It could cost, it could cost money. There could be a lot of time. Uh, we have to be clear on our priorities. And you're, notice that you're still listening. 
right? You're not assuming the client wants money. Maybe the client doesn't want money. You can't assume the client wants a divorce, right? You don't know, right? And so um, you're asking probing questions and you're trying to figure out the priorities of the client. That is the post narrative, right? So the client has told you the story. The post narrative stage, the third stage now, is when you're more involved, right, in getting answers and, um, and sharing some legal knowledge. After the post narrative stage comes the concluding stage for an engineer. This is the stage where you have broader idea of the issue and concern which you narrow it down to come to a specific point which needs to be litigated in the post-narrative stage. And the concluding stage is the stage which you, which you use to acquaint client some of the information which are really important in deciding the options which he has to settle the disputes, to settle uh, the mechanisms which are available for settling disputes, and what are the consequences of choosing available options for settlement of dispute. When a client approaches an advocate for the dispute which he has with someone, there are multiple ways of settling the dispute. The dispute can be settled through litigation before the court of law. The dispute can also be settled through alternate dispute resolution mechanisms. And each, each method of dispute resolution has its own pros and cons. So it is the duty of an advocate to inform the client that what exactly could be the consequences of opting any of the available modes, methods, and options of dispute resolution. <coughs> Second aspect is understanding of a layman and understanding of a busy advocate in terms of time and in terms of certain term varies. A time which could be a reasonable for scheduling second meeting or getting some relief on the application of a uh, client may vary what, what, what a client may consider reasonable to hear back from a client or getting the relief. So this is another aspect which should be clarified in the interview itself. That when the client offer any of the available modes of dispute settlement, what could be the duration for getting relief ultimately, and what could be the duration for getting intermediate relief? How many uh, years or months, or what could be the duration of the time which may which he may have to invest to litigate or to get engaged, involved in alternate dispute resolution mechanism to settle the dispute? It is also the duty of an advocate to inform that this process of litigation is very time consuming, it's very expensive, and it's very tedious. So that these things doesn't come as a surprise to a client once he has stepped into a boat of litigation. He should take, the client should take an informed decision that, okay, these are my concerns, and out of the uh, available options, this particular option he or she wish to choose to settle his dispute, to redress his rights, and everything comes with, his, with, with its own cost. So whatever mechanism which he's choosing brings with it its pros and cons. So that tomorrow, this fact of consequences of the option adopted by a client does not become a matter of concern, dispute, or distress between a client and an advocate. Because you have informed in, his, in advance that what is the duration of time which will be invested, what is the cost of litigation and how tedious it is. Because maybe it may happen that he may have to take leave from his work, he may have to leave some other work in which he's engaged to, uh, to, to come to the court for presenting his case, to come to the office of the uh, advocate, uh, to discuss the knowledge and information and so on. And last but not the least, the fees of an advocate should also be informed in the interview itself so that a client takes an informed decision in all respect, be it the expenses which may have, he may have to clear for giving the advice, support, assistance of uh, you as an advocate and also the uh, expenses and cost of the system 
which he wished to opt for for settling his dispute. So we have a, a short video now um, that shows an example of a client interview. Um, and it takes place in the context of actually a law school clinic. Um, if you're not familiar with um, this particular model of a, of a clinic, or I'm not sure if they have those in Turkey as part of the legal education, but it's, no? Okay, so um, a law school clinic is uh, basically a small law office at the law school where clients are interviewed and students are supervised by attorneys. Well, I'm giving you the US definition, Barty, you might give the Indian definition. Um, uh, uh, students are supervised by attorneys, right? And um, you, the, the, the law office assists the client for a low cost basis, on a low cost basis, right, for low cost. So it's a way of getting more legal help to more people, right, through the law school um, and, um, it's also a way for the students to practice their skills, but under the supervision, right, of an attorney. So this is the setting of the interview. Um, so we're gonna play a little bit, and then we're gonna ask you um, to tell us how the portion of the, um, how the interview relates to what you've just heard us talk about. Okay, so you, I'm, going to, I'm going to be asking for participation. Okay, so you, you've been forewarned, all right? Um, so we're gonna start this YouTube clip and we'll stop it after a couple minutes. Yeah. Uh, so we are playing this video for you. It demonstrates uh, the theory which we just uh, discussed with you and you need to analyze and assess your knowledge and understanding. <laughs> This is from an Australian university, so I hope everyone can understand the accents, the Australian accents. What? Oh. Uh, video is not I I said, I Uh, we're just trying to we're just trying to play the video and uh, so that you could watch and hear it simultaneously. Are you able to see? I do see anything on your screen right now. You don't see the video. No, nothing. Okay. Oh, I know. So maybe it's a new share. A different screen, maybe. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Do you see it now, the YouTube? No. No? Okay. If you share screen, maybe Hassan may help you. He is very capable. I know. You just call our technician. Hmm. We could we could we could go ahead to the emotion exercise and then come back to this. Yeah. I just, yeah. Sure. <coughs>
Professor, if you make me co-host, I can share my own screen and show the video. Uh, can you see it now? Yeah, we, we, we see now. She solved it. <laughs> Let's try again. Let's take a seat. Hi, Christy. Um, my name is Robin Smith, and I can see that this is the first time you've been to our service, so I'm just going to talk you through the process. We are a free community legal service, which means you don't have to pay us for any of the work we do, but we can't account for any legal costs that may arise. But we can talk about any possible costs a bit later. There are a couple of things I need to explain. First, anything you tell me will be treated as confidential, and I won't discuss anything you've said with anyone outside of this firm unless you give me permission. Secondly, if I need to communicate with anyone in order to obtain information or talk to anyone else about this issue, I will ask for your permission first. Uh, so we normally communicate by letter, so is this your best postal address? Okay, and is this your best contact phone number? And if I need to leave a message, can I leave it on that phone number or would you rather I wait until I can talk to you in person? Yeah, you can leave a message on that phone. All right, so I'm just going to need to get you to sign an indemnity, which just explains everything I've just told you. So would you like me to read through that, or would you rather look through it yourself? That's okay. One thing it does say is that because we are a free legal service, we have a limited capacity, which means that we may not be able to help you, but if we can't, we will refer you to somebody who can. Right. So does that mean you can't help me? Why don't you tell me your problem first, and then I can give you an idea of what I can do. All right. Okay, so we saw, I'm going to stop it there, right? So we saw um, the beginning of the interview, right? What do you, what did you see that sounded familiar? Um, or what did you see that maybe didn't sound familiar? Um, there is one point, um, which I will we'll get to, but anyway, um, please tell me what you saw that ha happening in those first Two minutes. Uh, I mean, like we are trying to ask that as we go through the different stages and in the clip, you just observe a part of the interview, which stage of the interview, which we just discussed, does it relate to? Uh, the opening stage. Yes, good. And so just to review, right, would you mind telling us what are the things that the uh, attorney did during the opening stage? Uh, so at the opening stage, she gave an overview of the um, the firm. She told about like what they do, what kind of work they do, and then like uh, they provide free services, right? And then um, uh, well, other than that, yeah, she gave a brief introduction basically. And the yeah, and she told about the client counsel confidentiality. Uh, confidentiality. Yes, so that's something I don't think we've mentioned yet. So um, that is an ethical rule in the United States and in many jurisdictions, right? And so you'd have to look at your jurisdiction to see where that ethical rule is, if it's statutory, um, if it's just advisory, right? Um, but the idea between, behind keeping the, the client communications confidential is that you then encourage the client, right, to tell the truth. Why is that good? Well, we know we don't want surprises, right? So if the client can tell you the truth, then you can serve the client the best. Um, did anybody notice what she said about contacting the client? Did anybody, not anybody notice that? Or she asked the client something about, yeah? I'm you can go, you, yeah. you can chime in. I see yeah. people nodding. Yeah, I, and I, we can also see the hands being raised. Oh, but, I'm but, sorry. But it's just that uh, we don't have the full screen to see all the hands raised. Oh. So uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, 
to say you can go ahead and please yeah um she asked about her um contact information and ask again that confirm uh, those contact information are true or wrong yes and um this is an aspect that may be important in domestic violence she said can i reach you here yes so, yes right right yeah. so uh that may be something you you get a question like that in the doctor's office too um sometimes you don't want the doctor to leave a message on your family phone right or you know a relative's phone right so that's why she she did that that's keeping it confidential right she doesn't yeah. know as an advocate who has access to this person's phone can i reach you here right so they've she's establishing a secure and confidential way to um to to reach her in the future right so that duty of confidentiality at the beginning um when that's expressed to the client that is um that that sets a nice uh, sets a nice tone right that's important uh, any other observations um did you notice how she said this is probably your first time i'm going to talk you through it right so you're even if you're a new lawyer a new student right or a, a, you know a student under the supervision of a lawyer you are more familiar with the legal system most likely right than a client now of course this is different if you're maybe doing corporate law and you're dealing with clients that have been represented by many attorney by attorneys in the past right um okay so let's move on let's move on now have you got any questions or do you need me to explain anything again how long do you think this will take okay well look what's going to happen today is i'm going to ex get you to explain what's going on and why you're here I'm going to ask you some questions so I can work out what the legal issues are and then we're going to have a talk about what you want to achieve and some options that might be available to us. That's probably going to take about an hour. And that might be as far as we get today. But the point of this interview is that I'll be able to have a better understanding and a better idea of what the next steps might be. So it's hard to predict how long legal problems can take to sort out. So why don't we start by you telling me why you're here and how I might be able to help you. Okay, well... I bought a car from Dodgy Deal Cars out on Mean North Road. It worked fine on the test drive, but from the moment I got home it was hopeless. I kept driving it for a few days, but then I rang them and said it was running really rough. But they said it just needed running in. Then, about a week later, it broke down. I had to pay to get it towed to a garage. They looked at it and said the spark plugs and some other thing, carburetor maybe, was worn and dirty, so they replaced them. That cost me $190. But then they said the whole car was rubbish, that it needed about $1,000 worth of work. Then the next weekend, it literally stopped. Smoke was coming out of the engine, there was oil coming out the exhaust. It was completely stuffed. It was a total disaster. I've got a job up at Mount Barker. That's why I bought the car. And I had to get it towed to Mum and Dad's house. That cost me $220. So my dad took me around to the dealer on Sunday the next day. And they said it was too bad, that it was a second-hand car and any problems were not their worry. That's not true, is it, though? Aren't there warranties for car sales? Why don't you just keep telling me what happened and we can get back to that later? Okay. Anyway, my dad and this guy had a huge argument and he said if we brought the car back, they'd have a look at it. But Dad said they had to organise the tow, not us. He said there was a warranty and the dealer had to fix it. But the guy said only if we brought it back. Then Dad got a mate of his who's a mechanic to look at the car. He said that the engine head cover thing was cracked and had been badly replaced. And that the car was just an accident waiting to happen. I paid $4,500 for it. He said I'd been totally ripped off. He said it needed about $800 worth of work under the bonnet. Leaky fuel lines, hoses not connected, brakes worn, and then I'd need a new engine, which would cost at least $1,500. I can't afford that. I saved up for a year to get this car. I've got nothing. He said they would have known it was a dodgy car and should have never sold it in that condition. Anyway, I really need this fixed. I can't get to work. I borrowed Mum's car last week, but I can't keep borrowing it. And if I lose this job, then I won't be able to pay my rent. Okay, well, thanks very much for all that information. Yeah, okay, so what just happened there? Tell me what stage that corresponded to. 
right? And stage. Good. I'm sorry. Uh, who's speaking? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take your responses. We are just uh, demonstrating uh, what do we expect you to respond. Uh, so I, we understand your curiosity to respond, mm -hmm. uh, but we would like you to first explain that what exactly you need to uh, think of, you watch in the video and then respond. Um, so what so what stage was this that you just listened to? Uh, Sevki, Sevki, I can see your hand raised. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first, I noticed that she made an overview of the interview because she may not know anything about the interview with a lawyer. So uh, I think it is uh, before the interview part, the first. Yes. 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 So what happened, so that's good, uh, is it Sevier? Yeah. yeah. So the very beginning, right, was not quite the narrative yet, right? The very mm -hmm. beginning yeah. was still at the, still kind of the initial stage. And uh, what was important about what the lawyer did at that point? Uh, she said that um, it's gonna be, I think one hour last, I don't remember the detail. And then um, she asked some open questions, not um, some questions in detail. So good. Yes. Yeah. So she she gave a time period. She asked an open ended question and she said what's important also is what she didn't say. She didn't say she was going to give her an answer in that interview. I'm going to tell you the answer. I'm going to tell you the law. So many times it's not expected that you give an answer right right away. It's better to check. And that lawyer, right, in addition to saying it, it's going to be an hour, tell me why you came, she also said, I will have to look at the law to, you know, basically to make sure she's giving the right answer, right? So that's important because when you're starting out as a young lawyer, you often think you have to have all the answers right away. Um, but that's not always the case. Right. And that's not really expected at the beginning of your career. It's more important to be careful. Right. To be careful. Right. And, and to work with your supervising attorney. So very good. Thank you. And then um, does someone want to tell me about the narrative stage? What happened in the narrative stage? Yeah. To see. Yes. Um, clients uh, tells about her story. And um, the attorney asked her, well, I don't exactly remember the question, but what brings you here today? Why are you here? She asked and clients start to um, tell her story about the car clients bought. Um, it, I don't know how much it cost, maybe lots of dollars. She asked, it was secondhand car. And she told that, um, Okay, that's all, that's all I'm saying. I'm a little, little bit exciting and I forgot how um, the stage was go, goes on. No, that's good. That's good. Um, yes, it was, um, it doesn't matter the cost, but yes, secondhand car. She paid yes. a lot. We understand that the car's not working and we understand okay. how frustrated the client is um, because she can't get to work, right? So already we're starting to see some of the, the issues the client is bringing to us, right? She paid a lot. The, um, the, the, the shop is not being helpful, right? She can't get to work. And, and she, she feels, you know, probably a little bit, she, well, she, you could see she feels, right, upset, right? She's, she's mad. The car is stuffed, she said. So maybe Australian slang for the car is no good, right? And she just spent all her money on this. Yeah. So I would just uh, like to add a small point to what just Professor Margaret said, that uh, the expression of the client is also something which reveals important information uh, about the client case. But at the same time, the advocate also needs to be very mindful of the expression which they exhibit to the client. Did you notice any such expression which you think was exhibiting their categorizing the client or some, uh, some some gesture or expression of not getting convinced kind of thing. Did you notice that on some of the narration, the advocate showed some expressions which can give an impression to the 
uh, client that advocate is not relying because constantly the client uh, the advocate needs to build a repo a, a relation of trust with which the client could feel more comfortable and open up in the narrative stage and so that the client uh, so that the advocate could get as much information as possible so did you notice uh, the expression of uh, advocate which you think was was kind of scrutinizing expression I contact ma'am. Okay, fine. Another another uh, point I, I just wish to add on that uh, you might have noticed that during the narration of her story, the client asked a specific question to which the advocate responded that, okay, I'll respond to it later, but you go ahead with this information story. Because if the client, if the advocate starts responding to the questions, of the of the client, then it may go in a different direction, and an advocate may lose out on wider perspective of the information. That is why narrative stage is a stage where an advocate should facilitate and encourage by asking open-ended questions, uh, so that more and more information could be gathered. And even if the uh, if the client asks some specific question at that stage, that can be can be hold on for being answered towards the post narration stage is what has been exhibited and de demonstrated in this video. Yes, okay, let's see. watch more. Now, I'd just like to go over what you've told me and make sure that I've got it all right. And then I'm gonna ask you a few questions about what happened in particular dates and events. Is that all right? So you bought a used car from dodgy car sales. You thought the car was running badly and after a week you had to get some work done on it. Then a few days later, the engine blew up. You've discussed this with the dealer and they said they'd look at the car if you brought it to them. You've had a mechanic look at the car and he says it needs a new engine, some other work under the bonnet, and that the faults were obvious. He thinks it will cost about 2,300 to fix the car. And you're dependent upon the car for work and need transport urgently so you can keep your job. Now, is that all correct or is there anything I've missed? Yeah, that sounds like everything. Okay, so I have a few simple questions that I need to ask just to get down details and facts. On what day did you purchase the car? Um, it was a Wednesday, three weeks ago. Okay, we can sort that out. Um, and did you sign some sort of contract with the dealer? Um, yeah, I think I still have it somewhere. Um, well, I'll need to get a copy of that. And I'm going to make a list of the things that I need you to follow up on later, okay? All right, I'll have a look at home. Great. Um, now, when did the car first break down? Basically, the day after I bought it. Okay, and what was the date and the time that you first called the dealer? I can check in my phone records when I get a chance, but a few days after I bought it. And who was the mechanic that first fixed the car? I'm pretty sure it was called We Can Fix It. And would you possibly have a detailed receipt of that work? Yeah, I think I have it at home somewhere. And do you have a receipt for the tow? I honestly don't know. I'm sorry, I can check. Okay. Um, and what was the date that the engine actually blew up? It was about two weeks after I bought it. I can, I remember I can check that one because I called my friend and my phone would keep a record of that. Okay, that's great. And finally, when did you confront the dealer about the car? It was last Sunday. Great. Okay. Christy, you've asked me whether there are warranties on used cars. Uh, there is a legislation that deals with consumer rights for, for used cars. Now, what I'll need to do is look at the legislation in order to advise you what your options are. There are different rules depending on the values of cars. Now that you give me all the information, I can check that whether this will actually apply to you. You said that the dealer said they'd look at the car when it got back there. So have you thought about whether it might be worth paying to have it towed there? I mean, is, is, is that an option? No, I've got no money at all. I can't do that. And it's not fair. Why should I have to pay out more money? I've already put all this cost on my credit card. It's not fair. Okay, well, it's just one option. I just wanted to raise it with you to see if we could speed up the process. It can take a while to sort out legal problems like this, and there's never a guarantee of the outcome. Now, you seem really concerned about getting to work. Is it worth looking into hiring a car or figuring out how much that could cost? I can't afford that. I've just moved into the new flat, bought the car. I've got no money at all. Not till I get paid next fortnight, and not even then if I can't get to work. Okay. Well, I'm gonna need to do some research into your rights against dodgy dealers. 
I'll do that in the next couple of days and write your letter suggesting some options and giving some of my advice, okay? The sooner the better, I guess. Because what, I, what I'm thinking, Christy. Um, okay, we're almost done, but I'd like to, just so we don't lose, right, lose out on uh, this good reminder of what to do. Um, what did you see happen in that stage, right? What stage did it correspond to and what important things did the advocate do, the attorney, right, during that stage? So one specific question is, um, did you notice what the attorney did, right, at the beginning, so that the, the, the client finished speaking, and then, um, okay, uh, the, the, go ahead, I see a, a hand up from Stanton. Uh, yes, so it was the starting of the post-narrative stage, I believe. But initially, yes, I think the one important thing that the um, lawyer did was that she rephrased the whole narrative. So she was trying to make sure that I think that uh, she got all the information correctly from the client. And then if she has left out anything, so she was asking her again to make sure that she got all the needed, all the relevant information and the facts. Yes, very good. So um, that's a technique called active listening, right? The person reports, right? And you summarize and report back. So then it's like a tr it's creating a transparency, right? The, the uh, lawyer is showing, I heard you, and this is what I heard. And it's an opportunity for the client, right, to make any suggestions or corrections. Did you also see the camera showed the attorney was taking notes? Right, um, and so that's normal. That's not. That's we all need to take notes. We will not maybe if we're very busy as an attorney. Um, notes will help us with that. Right. Um, after that, what did the attorney start doing? And it corresponds to the stage. Yeah. Yes. Then she started asking uh, her specific questions relating to the purchase of the car and the receipts, if she has kept any. Um, yeah, she basically she was asking about the documents and then when did the car break? All those um, questions were asked. Yes, so do you remember though that we uh, mentioned in the uh, PowerPoint probing questions? So these are yes. questions where you're asking for evidence, you're asking for examples. Did you notice she asked for dates? She needs all these specifics. That's not necessarily part of this client's story, but those are all the specifics. Oh, I see. Okay. Is that we might be able to write to the dealers, alerting them of your claim and asking them to pay for a loan car. Now we'll need to get your car back to the dealers and we might be able to ask them to pay for the tow, but if they're not willing, we'll have to pay to get it towed there ourselves. Okay, that's fine and all, but how am I going to get to work until then? I really need the money. I think you're going to have to find alternative transport. Is there any way you could borrow a car or, or hire one or maybe even look in public transport? Would I be able to get the money back from the dealer? Look, I don't know, Christy. If you have a claim against them under warranty or breach of contract, we can include all those extra costs in the claim, but it's too early for me to say until I've done any preliminary research. Either way, it's going to take some time, so we need to work now to get all arrangements in place. So I need you to do some work for me. I need you to send me the contract with the dealer and any other information about the sales of the car, receipts, warranties, etc. I need you to get me the receipts and the service record from the mechanic who did the first repairs to show what work they did and also a receipt from the tow truck. I have a written list here for you. Also, can you get your dad's friend who looked at the car to write a short report or a letter saying what he thought about the condition of the car? And finally, could you take some photographs of the car, particularly under the bonnet and of the engine cover, etc., because that might be really useful later. I'd also like you to find out about how much it would cost to get the car towed to the dealers, or even if you could find out somebody who could tow it for you, maybe hire a car trailer from a service station. I mean, is that something that your dad or his friend could help you with? Also, you thought you might inquire about the cost of a hire car just to tide you over for the moment. So I'll send you a letter in the next couple of days confirming what we've discussed today and telling you what I found out about the warranty situation. Now listen, there's a lot of work to be done, and. We'll need to figure out how you're going to get it to work until until we can figure this all out. So, 
We're going to talk over your legal options. We will sort it all out. And I might ask you to come in in a week or so to discuss these options. Could you come see me around the same time next week? Uh, yeah, sure, that should be fine. Okay, let's go make an appointment. Great. So in um, the very end, we see what stage and what important tasks are, is the attorney doing? I see uh, a hand up from Sevki. I think this is concluding stage and um, the lawyer gave some homework to her clients and uh, she wanted to take some picture and uh, bring some information about the case. I noticed this. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, uh, Sedki, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, yeah, this is the concluding stage where the attorney is asking for a document to do research, to see to what extent the relief which the client expect and wish to is, is legally feasible. At the same time, she clarifies the time which needs to be invested and when can she get the next appointment. So in, the, in this concluding stage, we get to see what we... Uh, what we learn uh, during our factual and theoretical narration of the concluding stage, that how clarifying these things help the client to take an informed decision and to have a cordial relationship with the advocate because as I discussed earlier, that reasonableness of time for getting new uh, next appointment and also the uh, court date varies in the terminology which is being used by the client and the advocate. So it very well exhibits and de demonstrates what we studied about three stages of uh, interviewing. And I'm sure that it has further clarified and strengthened your understanding about the stages. Uh, so with this, we wish to move ahead to give you an opportunity to exercise uh, the, uh, the concept theory and the skill which we have learned so that you can further refine your understanding and you can become more uh, comfortable in applying this skill through the practical exercises. So I'll be sharing my uh, screen. And Okay. Okay. Um, can everybody see the screen? No. Okay. Is it visible now? Yeah, but it's just that I'm not getting it. Yes, I see one million. I believe that now the slides can be seen. Okay, are we all set? We can see it now? Yes, it is seen. Okay, thank you. So um, we saw a great demonstration. Just to review, everything the lawyer did there um, is avoiding surprises both in her own information, right? Um, and also for the client. So we don't want, the client doesn't want surprises and you don't want surprises. So this is, um, this slide just kind of talks about um, some ways in which we can avoid surprises and also gets you to try to remember how difficult it can be for a lawyer to speak to a client, right? So we, we have the narrative stage because we want the client to tell the story. We don't want to interrupt the client, right? And we want to remember that the client may have some emotions or may have some embarrassment, right? Or may not be sure who is in charge or who's the leader or may defer, overly defer to the lawyer. Um, so um, this kind of brings us to the next um, thing to consider, right? Um, and that's the role of emotions and feelings, right? For in, a, in an environment, right? Where you can often be, it can often be highly charged, right? It could be the worst day of the client's life, right? Um, either 
because it's a divorce, uh, you know, or a criminal proceeding, or they could just be highly frustrated, like the example we saw, right? So we're going to launch into um, a discussion, right, about the how do we deal with that? Let's think about that. Let's do a let's have a discussion. Um, and brainstorm, right? Let's think of different situations we know maybe where um, friends or relatives, right? Um, that we know have gone, had to see an attorney. So I'm not asking for any confidential information, but I'm asking what are some of the feelings that and emotions that a client could have, right? What are some of those emotions? Uh, just to add to Margaret's explanation for the exercise, for better thinking and imagination, you can uh, relate this client as a client of domestic violence. So, for example, the client is a client of domestic violence. So, what kind of feelings do you foresee to be more exhibiting or more expressive when such client comes for an interview with you? And what are the ways to deal with those uh, feelings of the client while taking uh, interview because see for getting the relevant information you need to make the client feel uh, comfortable you need to make him feel respected and even when the uh, reaction of uh, feeling comes before you during the sharing of information how you respect and empathize towards that feeling uh, of the client also makes a difference and also adds to the rapport and the building of a relationship which you develop uh, through that uh, conversation of sharing information. So keeping in mind that you are interviewing a client of domestic violence, so what kind of feeling do you expect from the, uh, from the client and how do you think you can uh, manage or deal with those uh, feelings so that it doesn't come in the way of you getting the relevant and complete information which is needed to take certain important decisions. So write down on your paper and we give you one minute's time. We give you one minute's time. You just think you need to write down on your paper that what kind of uh, uh, feelings can you expect a client to express while narrating his or her story? And how will you respond to those reactions to deal with them in such a way that it doesn't come in a way of getting smooth flow of information? Your time starts now. <laughs> I'm keeping time. And once you're done, you can start raising your hands. Mm -hmm. Take your one minute's time and then you can start raising your hands. Uh, Professor, we uh, uh, can see your hand raised if you wish to add on or like give your inputs. We are more than happy to take it from you. Okay, after everybody writes down, I just want to give one example. Okay, thank you. So you can raise your hand when you're ready to share some of your ideas. And I'm really curious to hear what, what all of you have to say. So, so you need to tell what kind of feeling, how it, point two, how it is being expressed 
by the client. Point three, how you responded to that expression of feeling to deal with it. Uh, I think Professor Yannis says students uh, have done with their uh, writing part. Now we would like to hear from you. Now I have a case related to a man who wants to return to his village. Uh, the village is abandoned and there's not nobody living in the village because everybody want, went to big cities to work. And this husband wants to return to his home village with his family. So they have two children and his wife, they go back to the, to the village, but they are alone in this, in this village. And the children don't get any education and the wife is sorry about this. And in the family, they start a quarrel about this situation. Now the uh, woman, wants to have legal advice. He comes to the trial lawyer. And the lawyer uh, consults with her and her feelings, understands her feelings and her wish. So she wants to live with, his, with her husband, with her children, but uh, she wants also the, uh, red, uh, the problem settled. She wants that her children get a education, but she don't, doesn't want a divorce, but she wants just to go back to a normal situation. So mm -hmm. this is her feelings. And how does the lawyer help her in this situation? So she gives her some advices, etc. But uh, this is a real story. I wanted just to mention it to you. A, a family violence, but family violence has its reasons. So there's also family violence in the situation? Yes. I see. Okay. Um, and so um, are you sharing, Dr. Yenesey, what the client's feelings are? Can you imagine what the client's feelings are? Or would you like some of your students to imagine that? Uh, I, I prefer students to talk. So okay. I don't give you an example. Okay. I think I saw some... Hands up, Tuxi. Tuxi, oh, oh, raise, raise her hand. Yes, go ahead, Tuxi. Can you unmute? Am I still? Now you are unmuted. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, they can be desperate, um, feel sad, and uh, feel fear, or maybe they uh, physically in pain. So um, a, um, a attorney first make sure that they understand their clients and they have to emphasize their emotions and the uh, st st situations. They must be willing to help their clients and make sure that clients feeling they're, uh, they're willing to about help. Mm -hmm. After that, an attorney uh, should think how we uh, could solve this problem or how can I help them? Yes, yes. Um, sadness, desperation, fear, pain. Um, yeah. Those are all very strong feelings and those are feelings that you may see in a variety of circumstances and especially domestic violence. Can people think of additional, any additional feelings? Anger. What do you think about anger? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stanton? Yeah, we see your hand raised. Uh, yeah, I think uh, someone who has gone through a domestic uh, violence, uh, he or she could have, um, you know, um, trust issues. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and speaking to a lawyer who is a complete stranger, she may not be able to open up. Mm -hmm. So, and then she might be on the verge of a breakdown also. So as she speaks, like all the emotions may come up and she may break down. So in that case, in such a case, basically, uh, the counsel has to be extra sensitive and patient with her, with the victim, uh, so the client. So um, and, and the, maybe the uh, uh, 
counsel uh, he can he can he she can ask um, about you know if uh, she has a safe place to go and tr try to help her also uh, you know with i don't know saying us something and uh, and then other than that like she can try offering her a uh, like warm beverage or napkin or something and try to calm her down and then give her like the needed time to for her to open her uh, open up and speak like yeah so what i'm hearing stands and say oh and i hear uh, what i'm hearing stands and say um is um empathy right i'm hearing also what's implied we're not judging our clients if they feel that they are going to be judged right in a harsh way in a negative way um that's not helpful that that, with that might cause them to stop talking right um so you're so in terms of dealing with the emotional reaction you're talking about empathy and i hear you talking about non-legal resources non-legal solutions right so a lawyer can't always provide counseling safety right for the client right that may be more outside of our jurisdiction right more than we can do but we can help them provide resources and we can recognize that there are non-legal solutions uh, Abhay, and I can see Abhay's hand, and after Abhay, uh, the Sevgi can uh, respond. Abhay, Abhay Shukla. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, hi. Uh, so I just, I was thinking that uh, the client can also feel a feeling of self-doubt as they are a victim. Uh, they can be a victim, so they might be feeling that as this process of going through and just pursuing the justice and going, coming to court, and going to a lawyer, which is uh, itself, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time. So they can also feel whether they are doing the right thing or not by coming to the lawyer, by approaching the court, by going through that process, by putting themselves into it. So they can also feel self-doubt and uh, because they don't know what is going to come uh, and how much time it's going to take. So I think the lawyer also has this responsibility of making sure uh, that they... Uh, that the client is feeling, client feels that, okay, there is something, I can get justice. Okay, what is the procedure? What lies ahead? And also uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, that's it now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Abhi. Uh, Sevgi, and then we'll move on to another exercise. Oh, okay. We'll take, uh, we'll, we'll take a response of I, I will also. I actually think of the three feelings. One of them is actually thinking, and I want to ask something about it too. The first uh, two of them is uh, sadness and hopelessness, and we mentioned them actually. Um, I think lawyer can deal these two feelings with sharing her plans, uh, which is going to take place during the case. So maybe client can uh, feel the trust of uh, she, her lawyer, I think. And the thinking is that um, some uh, cases in criminal law uh, in Turkey, compulsory defense attorney can be considered as a government officer, just like a police officer or a prosecutor. Uh, this is a problem uh, I heard from some lawyers and lawyers should clarify at that point that uh, she is going to do everything under the law to help the clients. So I think this is a really um, big issue um, because they think that um, the information that the client uh, gives to his um, lawyer is going to be used against him. So I think uh, there should be a really um, problem solved. Thank you, Sergey. Um, and I, I, I look. Hi, everyone. Um, we must try to understand he or she. Uh, we should not surprise our in emotions. Uh, we must identify the problem and calmly focus on the solution. Uh, we need to understand that we empathize uh, and show our science certainty. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. Yes, um, you've really thought about this a lot. I love hearing what you think. Um, and I, I want to also just mention that another very big motivating um, uh, emotion could be shame, right? People can feel ashamed of what they did or their situation. And that can, that can be, it's a very human emotion. It's a universal emotion. And then that keeps you from talking, right? And so if the client, if the attorney doesn't judge, shows trust, shows respect, you know, 
hopefully we can mitigate that that sh yeah. that shame yeah so the uh, agenda or the reason behind this exercise is to make you realize that not only how you ask the question and how you listen uh, the information shared in response to your question but also your conduct to deal with the uh, with the emotion which can really make the difference and uh, can help you in getting the relevant information and the best way to deal with the emotion of a person or emotional responses of the client who is in pain, anger, anguish, or maybe shy or afraid, whatever kind of uh, emotion and uh, uh, emotional experience a person is going through, the best way to deal with this, let it flow. Don't restrict. If you restrict the flow of emotion, feelings of expression of the client, it may restrict the flow of information also. And if you restrict the flow of information, it puts you at detrimental position. And you may not be able to present the case of your client strongly because you are void of uh, important relevant information. So never ever try to restrict the flow of feeling, emotion, expressions, uh, tainted or uh, colored with uh, feelings of your client, either through your words or through your body language. Because you communicate through your own expression. You communicate through your body language. And through the body language, through that empathetic body language, you create that relationship of trust, empathy, which makes a person comfortable with you, which creates a relationship of trust between you and client. And, and to sensitive cases like domestic violence, the first and foremost thing is to have a feeling of trust with your uh, advocate because that person has gone through a feeling of distrust with the person who happens to be his or her family member. So to open up and to trust again on somebody else to share that uh, relevant information, you need to have that feeling of empathy and confidentiality. So this is the uh, outcome of this exercise. Now with this, we wish to move ahead to the next set of exercise. Uh, Yes, uh, mm -hmm. Professor uh, Faradun, we wish to hear from you. Uh, before you go to the second exercise, I wish to emphasize the uh, uh, sexual crimes victims. If they tell their story again, they are re-victimized. So is it a problem with uh, storytelling to the lawyer? Or how do you avoid this secondary victimization? Is, is there some special treatment for sexual crime victims? Yeah, so that's a very good question, Dr. Yanisi. And um, I am familiar with some resources that talk about trauma, that, are, that talk about trauma-informed interviewing. So I think that's what you're referring to, whether the trauma is from maybe war crimes, right? Or sexual crimes. Um, but I don't know that I, we can cover it right now. Um, but I would like to talk to you after the class, for, uh, you know, uh, and, and provide you with the, with those resources. And I also have a, a, a very good friend who's an expert in this and in trauma informed um, lawyering and trauma informed interviewing. And so I would like to maybe after the class talk further with you about your needs and your questions and then, um, you know, get 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 the get the right resources for you. But that's OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so we go ahead with the second exercise, uh, uh, which is about drafting a schedule or plan of interview. So you received a phone call from a client, and only information which you get through that phone call is that uh, there is an injury uh, from an automobile accident and that uh, victim of uh, accident wish to have consultation with you uh, to share the pain and agony uh, which he uh, experienced uh, from that accident and the physical uh, loss to, the, uh, to, to, to his body, which he has experienced from that, exp uh, suffered from that uh, accident. And now you need to plan for that interview. So when we give, we, we, have a, we are going to break uh, the group. We, uh, we have approximately uh, 15 students. So we are going to 
divide the students in the group of three or four uh, so that we could evenly divide the students. So students in a group need to discuss among themselves because it gives an opportunity to know each other, uh, know each other and discuss among yourself. And then you need to elect one of the group members to uh, present the discussion which you have in your individual groups. And we will be visiting uh, each of the groups to see in case you need any assistance mm -hmm. in doing your work. Uh, so I hope we could make us clear that you received a phone call. You are an attorney advocate. You received a phone call from a person who suffered injury because of a road accident. And that person wished to fix an appointment with you to share his uh, mm -hmm. uh, concern, issue and problem and to know uh, the legal inputs and the legal uh, recourse which he or she can opt for. Uh, so how do you plan about it and what arrangements do you do you make for it? And you, for doing that, you need to keep in your mind relevance of interviewing skill, your pre-narration, the opening stage, pre-narration stage, narration stage, post-narration stage, conclusion, and how you deal with the emotions. So you need to exhibit, incorporate, all those stages and inputs of all the stages which we just discussed with you which we demonstrated through the video and we learned from previous exercise of dealing with emotions so go ahead to your time and how much time are they going to get um i think they can do 10 minutes uh, so mm -hmm. each group will get 10 minutes you are going in your individual groups so before you you are being sent to your individual groups do you have any question because once we say okay then you will be going to different groups and uh, so before going to groups do you have any specific question to ask right. anyone in the group can uh, can present uh, the discussion which took place in the group so as nobody is raising the hand i hope we could explain what is expected in this group exercise so we can we can send uh, everyone to the group okay. Uh, we have sent the link kindly join uh, join uh, through the link shared you've received a link you need to accept the joining and then you go to your respective groups we will be visiting each of the groups After, after, are you finding it difficult to join the group? Or Hassan, will he be joining? Professor, professor all the students has joined. Oktar, uh, Dr. Sali Oktar is member oh, okay. of the faculty. Oh, great. Fine. Yeah. Um, Okay, so now uh, can uh, I mean we would like to visit the different groups to see how they are working so that we could guide them in their tasks. So if you permit, can we go to the groups? Or Professor Yanis, do you have any inputs? No, I'm just listening and watching you. Very interesting. <laughs> We're just trying to make it as interactive as possible because it's a skill course and we learn skills while doing it. <laughs> That's correct. It should not be just a theoretical cramming of certain concept. It should be deep internalization of the concept in a comfortable manner so that you could use, they could use it the next time they happen to do this work. Uh, very well designed and very well applied. Thank you very much. Really Thank good. you. <laughs> and I have a lot I want to talk to you after the class about your question. You, you're absolutely right that there are some issues uh, with trauma-informed lawyering that we have to be very careful about as attorneys. But let's talk about it after, because we're being recorded, and let's talk about it after, and I can talk more about it then. Forward, okay. <laughs> can you send us to group, different groups? We want to the option there. Oh, I see, we join, okay. Uh, we join? just, we just. Okay, we can join any group, yeah, right? Yes. Yeah.
So welcome back. I hope everybody has joined back after the brief discussion about uh, uh, the interview plan uh, in the light of discussion we have had so far and the demonstration which we have through video and the exercise which we did before the exercise. And now we would like uh, each group representative to present in just uh, two to two minutes or uh, two to three minutes maximum uh, the concrete outcome of the discussion which took place in their breakout rooms. So can we start with room one? Uh, do you know your room numbers? I hope yes. Do you, do you know your room numbers? Good question. Uh, room one, uh, as per our record, is of Abhay Shukla, so that group can start. Room two is, uh, is, is of uh, or is of a group which has Rituja and group three uh, is of the uh, is of the group of students which has Shubhankar in it. So uh, I request a group which has Abhay Shukla. When I say which has Abhay Shukla, it does not mean that I'm asking Abhay Shukla to present. Anybody can can present. It's just that uh, I got this information from the people who are who are helping us in breakout rooms that that group has this particular student. Uh, we are running out of time, so we wish if you could present quickly so that we could give you our inputs. Or would, uh, would group two would like to take a lead and then later on group one may come up? Group two, would you like to present? Just need to speak for two minutes to tell what did you what did you write in response to those four stages okay we can so we will talk as uh, two people if you okay with it and in firstly opening stage uh, we should create a trust about the information the client will give uh, be safe with us some small talk should take place to create a trustful atmosphere here and we need to ask some questions about the client is physically hurt or not because of the um, uh, case, because it's about an accident. And we should make an overview, for example, how long the interview is going to last. And in the narrative stage, uh, we should ask some uh, open questions, not detailed ones. Uh, for example, what happened before the accident or how the accident happened? Um, clients talks about the accident in that stage. Uh, we have to note the client's words, so this will be a good way of listening. And then some detailed focused questions will be asked. Uh, and we can give the example of, uh, is there anyone hurt beside you? So we can learn a lot of things about the accident. Uh, where were you? We can ask that too. And then post narrative stage. Uh, very good, Sevki. Next okay. year. Yeah, next student in the same group. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to speak about the concluding stage and the emotions involved. Mm -hmm. So in the concluding stage, as my friend Sevki already said, like, so now we have heard the client's narratives. So now in this concluding stage, like, we may not be able to provide the best legal solution now. So we can set up a meeting with the client for the next coming week and so on, like with the uh, asking the client's convenient, when would it be suitable to have a, another meeting with the client? So, and uh, and then yes, so meanwhile, the, we uh, will look at our statutes and laws to try to provide the, with the best legal solution. So meanwhile, we do that, we can ask the client to gather the documents and the receipts which would include, for example, like, uh, we'll ask the client, like, uh, can you try to get the doctor's testimony or like, you know, uh, the hospital she went to about the bills or if you have uh, insurance, like if you have the health insurance. So have you contacted your health insurance company? And then, you know, can you get the, I don't know, the gift report or I don't know what to get. And then like, and like, uh, while she went to the hospital so if there was a friend there or like did someone if someone was there with you when you got into the accident if there was a witness or someone involved like so can you can you can can you get that person to you know give a report as well 
and then we can ask things like that uh, ask them to prepare the these documents uh, and then other than that concerning the emotions involved like uh, the person could be in uh, very much in physical pain and also in shock seeing uh, considering that he, he the person went through uh, an uh, accident so here i think our skills of empathy uh, is uh, comes into play like uh, you can ask simple questions like you know if the chair is comfortable for you to sit do you, uh, do you want me to you know get you something things like that and then since the person could be in shock uh, you know the incidents surrounding the accidents could be very blurry in his head so we need to ask uh, uh, so after the narrative part uh, in the post narrative like it would be very helpful if we can again uh, through our active listening skills if we can rephrase the you know whatever he, uh, the client said to us so that we uh, know that you know uh, it's like the correct information uh, yeah just to corroborate what we have heard so yeah that's it thank you uh, thank you so much because of limited time available we will be giving a group feedback like after all the groups uh, present uh, their uh, discussion, then collectively we will uh, give our feedback. So thank you. Thank you so much. Really uh, good attempt, uh, Stenzel. We really appreciate your attempt. Uh, next group, group three. Ma'am, you know, in the initial stage, we'll greet the client and make him or her comfortable around the surrounding and listen and ask about the client, about the accident, maybe. And then in the next stage, we'll encourage the client to speak, know his side of the story. And maybe building a confident reputation so that he could rely on us. And ahead this, we'll ask about the cost to repair or maybe about the anticipated and medical bills, about the injuries and other costs. Maybe funeral if someone has died, then not. And I, I've written to this point only. <laughs> Maybe someone else could continue. So anyone from group three would to add on to what just Tejashree said? Yeah, to say yes, we can see your hand raised. Yes. Uh, we talk about actually, and I can have just a little bit more uh, adding our story uh okay, first i'm we, sorry to interrupt you are you from group three or one yeah i'm from group three okay okay, okay. yeah go okay. ahead uh, after greeting our uh, client we talk about and ask about their story for opening and narrative stage if they seem uncomfortable or feel fear or speaking in a rush we help them to relax and make sure that we are understanding their situation for right now and after that um we ask about insurance. When did accident happen? Do you have photo taken about the accident or any witness uh, car model or when did client bought the car? After that, uh, it is a con uh, ask about what clients ex expect from us. Uh, just an ap ap apology or anything uh, that we gave them homework for bring documents and uh, discussion cost or how many, how much time this can be take and make sure they, uh, they are patient uh, about this issue. Uh, good, thank you, uh, Tutsi. Anyone thank from you. group one, group one, uh, would you like to add something because we are running short of time, we need to conclude today's session. Hello. Yeah. Yes, okay. ma'am, group one. Yes, ma'am, sorry for uh, earlier. So, ma'am, in the first opening bit, uh, we would firstly and like uh, introduce ourselves that I'm a lawyer. This is my work. I will be helping you. And uh, before that, uh, uh, just to make them relax, to sit and take their time, breathe, drink some water, so that because they are coming from in a situation which can be very shocking for them. So, just to give them a few minutes to sit and relax. After that, we can begin with that, okay, whatever you will say, it will remain confidential. Nothing is going out of this room. It remains with me. And uh, then ask them if they are all right to narrate us what is what exactly happened, where exactly happened. And in the narration bit where they will be telling us, 
which might not be relevant but still we have to listen to them because uh, i guess that's how they will feel comfortable uh, once they have done that in the post narration i believe is where we exactly get try to get the uh, information which is relevant like ask questions where was what was the date and timing if they remember what was the location which from where they were traveling and who was with them whether they were driving or there was somebody else was driving were they were, were they like all right and they were not nobody was drunk did any scuffle occur after the accident did uh, did what if they were attacked or not uh, or they were following the law because uh, or anyone fled the scene all these questions which can actually uh, like change the outcome in a way where where we don't want to be without a lawyer would not want to be without any information which is important in the conclusion i believe um, is uh, where uh, once we have listened to them we tell them that okay this is the options we have this is how it's going to be tell them that okay i'm going to do this work take some time the uh, follow, follow with my senior or the lawyer if i'm working with um then uh, try to comfort them that okay we have the solution do not worry just give us some time and uh, make sure if they are hurt they are sent to the hospital and a proper uh, check up has been done on them because i believe that is something which is important because i mean they can be hurt and if they sometimes what happens we don't even know that we are hurt so and uh, because that we are running short of the time so in the last uh, feeling part the, the i believe is that anger would be there uh, if uh, if by any chance they were under some like if they if there was a wrong on their part they could be feeling stupid that okay why did i do that or like any feeling can be there and uh, the shock can be there they need to be comforted so all those things and in that situation a lawyer will i guess uh, step out of the shoes of a lawyer and be the person by like comforting them by making sure that okay it has happened it's okay you are all right that is the most important bit and now the law will take uh, care of everything make sure and uh, and also in that situation that okay if you have lost your car in it or your uh, money is lost so the insurance would be there so do not worry about that all these things might comfort them that okay whatever they have lost is not uh, going to be huge and there is a uh, recourse to it Right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, okay, so I loved hearing from you. I think you all um, have gotten the idea about the different stages, and I'm hoping that when you listened to your peers talk about the interviews, uh, their their plans, that maybe you you realized, oh, I missed something, or I I didn't report something, right? So that's a very great way to learn. We're all learning from each other. So. Um, uh, I'll just kind of go in the order of, of the interview. Um, so in the opening, um, most of you mentioned confidentiality. Um, so according to your jurisdiction, you want to make sure you mention the ethical obligations in addition to making the person comfortable, right? The, the narration, um, I think you um, understood that very well. You talked about showing empathy and letting the information flow. Um, it, I, and most of you talked about um, under, most of you seem to understand that when it got, got to post narration and the probing questions, right? You that's when you need to kind of line everything up, right? What happened before the accident, at the time of the accident, after the accident, when, where, who, right? Get the full story, right? I think you understood that. You have to get all the facts then, right? Um, I liked how uh, when we got to the post narration. Uh, a group went through, most of you went through what you would need to get from the client. That could be anywhere from a medical report, photos, insurance, right? Um, photos of the car, right? If there were any witnesses, right? Um, as an attorney, sometimes you have also the means to help with this in terms of requesting a police report, but you always wanna ask and get everything from the client. Um, and then finally, I liked hearing about um, going over the client's expectations in terms of time and money, right? What do you expect? What do you want? What can we give, right? Um, what's reasonable? And important, it's also important what you say and what you don't say. You don't have to say, this is a great case. You're going to win it. You don't want to do that. You don't want to guarantee, 
right? Um, you maybe haven't done the research. You maybe don't have all the facts yet. So um, you don't know what the other driver said, right? Um, uh, so anyways, um, I know we need to conclude. Um, so those are, those, are, those are some of the thoughts that you don't have to leap to any conclusions. Um, you can always do research and get more facts before you give a legal opinion. Does that make sense? And, and does anybody have any questions? And do you have anything to add, Dr. Barty? Oh. Uh, so very good uh, inputs from all the students uh, participating in this course. And I, I believe that this exercise have helped you in sinking in and in crystallizing your understanding of the discussion which we have had so far. And through this series of exercises, I hope you understand uh, the concept which is we discussed uh, today better. And uh, I hope our uh, screen is visible to you. And now we come uh, to uh, the stage where we can conclude uh, the session today. And uh, we wish to leave uh, you with certain questions to think uh, on until we meet next time, that is tomorrow, 3 p.m. same time. So today we learned that how through these uh, skill of interviewing and dealing with the emotion of your client, you can build a, a good rapport and that rapport brings you more uh, work, more respect in the legal fraternity, uh, in the eyes of clients, and uh, you are better placed to promote justice. So uh, to the question with which we wish to leave you with today is, what kind of lawyer will you be or would you wish to be and how would you like to respond to your client if you wish to be uh, do you wish to be a client uh, do you wish to be a lawyer who wish to promote justice and for doing that put himself in the shoes of his client remain empathetic towards his client understand their pain and agony behave in a way that he, if not absolutely eliminate the possibility of victim getting uh, re-victimized or getting sec uh, treatment which could put him to, to secondary victimization, but treating them with, with respect, with care, with concern, and to ensure that whatever they share will be kept completely confidential so that they don't go through the, through a new series of agony, trauma, and pain, which they have already gone through a lot. So your conduct and behavior as an attorney and lawyer can actually, to an extent, prevent uh, the uh, secondary victimization of the clients which have trusted you, believed in you, and have managed to have faith in you and open up their heart to share your pain and agony and to reinstate their faith in the justice delivery system by uh, thinking of having lawful means for redressal of their dispute. Uh, with this, uh, I hand it over to Professor Margaret to give the concluding remarks. And after that, I would like to request Professor Yenese to, uh, to say a few words to conclude the session. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just want to thank you all for coming and for participating um, and for working hard and sharing your thoughts and not being afraid to share your thoughts with your peers in another country. We live in an increasingly global world and I love seeing, um, I love seeing all of you uh, interact. Um, and I want you to know we're here for you to ask questions. Um, I think you, you understood the overall concept, right? Prepare for the interview opening stage, narration, post-narration, um, you understood that concept. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll build on that tomorrow with our legal problem solving class um, and, and we look forward to it. So thank you and thank you, Dr. Yada, for um, putting all this together. Um, she is the logistical queen um, and Dr. Faridin, um, or Dr. Yassi, I'm sorry, uh, thank, thank you and, and do you have anything to add? Well, I really thank you, both of you, for preparing this course. In this course, I understand you are teaching students what we don't teach in our law schools. In U.S. law schools, you do this, but I don't know if it's India the case, but in Turkey, we don't teach our students skills. And this is a skills training course, very valuable. I congratulate you all, and especially the, uh, the answers, the 
uh, students now post was really satisfying. So I really thank you all and congratulate you all. And see you next tomorrow. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, yeah, Rituja, uh, we can see your hand uh, raised. If you have any quick question, uh, you can ask because otherwise, automatically, this. Yes, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, professors. Uh, actually, uh, there was an interesting input by uh, Professor Yanise uh, previously regarding uh, trauma interviews. 